Hello and welcome to the Thursday, October 27th, 2022 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich and today I'm recording from Augusta, Georgia. Today I wrote up a quick a little bit fun observation of an IoT device I recently connected to my home network. The device is a cat food dispenser and as many modern devices, well, it usually comes with Wi-Fi connectivity and an app to control it. Now, what drew my attention first was the fact that the dispenser calls out to Baidu, the Chinese search engine, every five minutes. At least there, there is a DNS lookup for Baidu. So far, I haven't actually seen the DNS feeder connect to the IP address that's being returned here. The DNS lookup for Baidu, I've seen it in similar devices before, is typically linked to a library I've seen them in Python, I've seen them in JavaScript that check if internet connectivity is present. So I assume that's what's going on here. These libraries are often, of course, written in China, which means that Baidu is sort of the logical choice there. Connecting to sites like Google uh, may not work, first of all, if the country level censorship is blocking access and uh, may actually get uh, people into trouble, which is also one reason why they may stick to Baidu. In addition, the device suffers from a flaw that's actually uh, sadly a little bit common in IoT devices like this, and that that it doesn't randomize the query IDs for its uh, DNS queries, it doesn't even increment them, it just keeps reusing the same query ID, which in this case is two, have seen it uh, use also query ID three, which of course would make it trivial to spoof a response. It also has an open telnet server. So far, I haven't uh, figured out uh, username and password. I haven't really tried too hard yet. Maybe I need to brute force some of the common password lists here or just expose it to the internet and see what happens. On a more serious note, the OpenSL project announced that coming Tuesday, it will release a patch for OpenSSL. This new release version 307 will fix a critical vulnerability and there have only been a fairly small number of critical vulnerabilities in OpenSL in the past. So this is something to certainly pay attention to. Versions of OpenSL 3.0 are, for example, used by Ubuntu 22.04. That's the latest uh, long-term support version of Ubuntu macOS Monterey. Haven't had a chance to check Ventura yet, uh, but it probably will use OpenSL 3.0 as well, because that's the current long-term support version of OpenSSL. Some older operating system, for example, Ubuntu 20.04, will still use the 1.1.1 version, which is not affected by whatever this new vulnerability will be. There will be an update for 1.1.1 on Tuesday, but it will not fix any security issues according to the OpenSSL projects. So you may wanna start checking your systems to see what version of SSL you are running. I know it's boring to do this ahead of time before it's an emergency, but uh, well, may actually give you a head start on whatever mad patching is coming up uh, next week. And an article in Wired reports that macOS Ventura released this week may actually interfere with uh, some security products. One thing that at Apple attempted to fix in Ventura is sort of outstanding issues with transparency, consent, and control, the TCC feature in macOS. That's where you basically can restrict access, for example, to the file system, to your contacts and such uh, for specific uh, projects and apparently uh, those restrictions uh, got increased so some of your security tools may no longer have full disk access so they can't really scan all of your files well a quick fix here 
double check if uh, you get any error messages there. They may be silent. You may not obviously see them depending on the security product. And uh, then in the privacy controls, just uh, give the security tools full disk access so uh, they can do their job again. And talking about uh, patches, VMware on Tuesday actually released a critical patch for VMware Cloud Foundations. The update fixes two different vulnerabilities, both XML related. One of the vulnerabilities fixes a remote code execution vulnerability in Xstream. Uh, this XML parser vulnerability has been known, I think, since August, maybe September, and does allow for unauthenticated remote code execution as root. So this is about as bad as it gets. And again, the vulnerability has been known for a while. Uh, just now we realize now we, uh, VMware told us that the Cloud Foundations actually uses uh, this library. The next vulnerability is an XML external entity vulnerability that could disclose files. It can also be used for denial of service attacks also unauthenticated. Well, and this is it for today. Thanks for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.